Good afternoon. Regular meeting number 55 will now come to order. I see you're all standing, so please, uh, <laughs> please play the national anthem. Pardon, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Monsignor Cody. Let us pray. Gracious God, as our nation prepares to celebrate Thanksgiving Day this Thursday, we come to you today grateful for your many blessings. The members of this city council are grateful for the support of the citizens of our city, and those newly elected and reelected are thankful for the confidence and the trust placed in them by their fellow citizens. As the members of this council meet to conduct the business of our city, help them to bring to bear their wisdom and foresight and talent to aid them in their deliberations on our behalf. And as we all gather at our family tables this Thursday, help us, Lord, to be truly thankful for the gift of our families and friends. And additionally, make us grateful for the freedom and opportunities we enjoy as citizens of our city, county, state, and nation. We also pray for the poor, neglected, the forgotten, and the powerless. May we reach out to them and never exclude them from our thoughts, our prayers, or our concern. This Thanksgiving Day and always, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Harden, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Just a reminder to everyone in the audience that any person who takes any action to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a, a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Uh, and any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Second. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office, they're listed on the agenda. They'll be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read in the record? Not this time. How about resolutions from members of council? Council Member Elizabeth Brown. Yes, thank you, President Klein. Um, as I read the title of our first resolution, I'd like to invite um, the representatives from the Columbus Women's Commission up to the microphone, please, um, including First Lady Shannon Ginther and Barbara Smoot. Um, we have resolution 0305X-2017 to recognize the Columbus Women's Commission for their efforts to advance gender and race-based pay equity for women through the Columbus Commitment. City Council affirms the City of Columbus as a signatory to the Columbus Commitment through this resolution, in addition to recognizing the ongoing incredible work of the Women's Commission. The Columbus Commitment shows that the City is serious about promoting opportunities for working families in all of our neighborhoods. Shining a light on the pay gap experienced by women in Central Ohio is an important first step. But following through with strategies and actions by local employers to eliminate wage disparities is how we ensure that we make a real difference in people's lives. That's what this commitment is all about and what the inspiring event held by Mayor and First Lady Ginther was all about on November 2nd. We have a brief 90 second video that we'd like to show that really explains the Columbus commitment. We'd like to follow it with um, some additional comments. 
today we are at the YWCA of Central Ohio partnering with the City of Columbus to announce the Columbus Commitment, which is a voluntary pay equity pledge that 61 companies have signed on to, committing to look at their pay practices and start to change the story around pay equity for women in this community. So the Columbus Urban League made the pledge to support the pay equity initiative because it's a no-brainer. Um, based upon the people that we serve, it is about empowerment and pay equity is empowerment. We are building a vibrant uh, city uh, economically and to do that we've got to have all aspects uh, of the city uh, pulling together. Equal pay is critical across the board whether you employ five or five thousand. At Nationwide, we understand that people matter, all people matter, and we believe that every associate should be paid equally for their work. We think that it's critical for all of our companies, not just the chamber leadership, but all of our companies to be early adopters in this. We had private sector leaders, uh, elected uh, government leaders, nonprofit leaders that all have agreed to be early adopters, uh, including the city of Columbus. Uh, to make sure that we're focused on pay equity, closing the gap, and empowering women uh, here in our community. Uh, great, and thank you to CTV for putting that video together too. It was really well done and um, shows the spirit that was um, truly alive on November 2nd. Um, the City of Columbus is committed to action. So the city is forming a task force to explore pay equity within all of our city departments. They're, the task force will then help us find ways to close the gender pay gap. The, our Human Resources Department has already removed the requirement for salary history on applications for city jobs, a policy that studies show makes it difficult for employees, especially women, to reach their full earning potential. The city is also requiring that all employees go through implicit bias training. So it's now part of the orientation process for new employees. Um, and some employees have begun that training. Bottom line is when women earn a living wage, we lift up entire families and the entire community. I'm so excited about this ongoing work and I'd like to turn it over to, um, actually first, before I turn it over to First Lady Ginther, I'd like to open up for any additional comments from my council members. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Brown, and, um, and thank you to the commission. Uh, the day that we had this event, it was interesting. I um, went to another event, and an individual kind of called me aside, and, um, and this individual works every single day and works very hard. Um, the individual went on to state to me that, what, uh, based upon a situation that was going on in this person's life, if it wasn't for a family member, she would be in the shelter. And she's working every single day. I asked her about her salary. And when she, this person stated their salary to me, um, it was certainly below the salary of the person who had previously been in the job. And realizing that it was virtually going to be impossible for that, pers that person to meet the demands of rent, utilities, taking care of their children on the salary that they were that they presently are earning. And so it was just pretty amazing after leaving this event, having that conversation. Um, and now since that conversation, I think that she is with the employer going to be brought up to the salary, which would be acceptable to what the person had previously before that. But had that not you know, just having this discussion, that person just, they had me for her sister, she'd be still going to work every day, but probably living in our shelter. And that's just unacceptable because as we do know that um, we know that who's in our shelter are a lot of women of color because of the salary. Mm -hmm. And this person is a person of color. And we just cannot continue, to, we just cannot continue to go down this path. So I appreciate the work that you're doing on the commission, but certainly the commission itself for standing up for women and ensuring that they're paid the salaries that they're deserving of. So I thank you, Councilmember Brown. I thank you to the commission for the work that you're doing to change women's and families' lives. Thank you. Thank you, President Pro Tem. Um, and before I turn it over, I'd like to move for adoption. Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Great. With that, First Lady Ginther. Thank you, Council Member Brown, Council President Klein, for a few more meetings, and the rest of Columbus City Council for having us here tonight. Um, 
we, your support of this work is is very meaningful us, to us, both as uh, an employer um, who's willing to ask the question within City Hall, City Council, throughout the entire city to make sure that we are um, doing for our women what we're doing for everybody in our community. Um, that commitment means a lot and um, was one of the first commitments that led other area employers to say, hey, this is, it's our turn. We need to look at our own numbers as well. So we really appreciate your ongoing commitment. When the mayor was elected, um, I knew that I too had an opportunity to represent women in this community. Um, and right away, really, I knew that that's, that's what I was gonna do. That's what I was passionate about, recognizing that 52% of our residents in this community are women. Um, and that we didn't know a lot of the data around the women and the families in our community. And so, um, you know, starting to look at the data, recognizing very early on that we're 78 cents on the dollar for pay equity, um, we knew we had an opportunity to change the story that Columbus doesn't do average or below average very well. That's not our story. And so it was great to, when we, thought about launching uh, the pay equity pledge on November 2nd, which was Latina Equal Pay Day, as I'm sure all of you know, um, we had hoped to have maybe 25 companies sign on, and we had 60 in three weeks. So this community is ready to have this conversation, um, and I appreciate the city's leadership, um, obviously the administration's leadership in support of this work, and um, this is just the beginning. So I'd like to introduce Barb Smoot, who is chair of the Women's Commission Pay Equity Committee and also the CEO and president of WELD, Women for Economic Leadership Development. Thank you, First Lady Ginther. And thank you, Council Member Brown. Council President Klein, and to the other council members present for this acknowledgement. The Pay Equity Committee has been working tirelessly for a year on this critical issue from, from the conceptual stage to the execution of the initiative. We learned from cities such as Boston, Seattle, and San Francisco, and decided that for our community, a voluntary employer-led pledge was the best way to bring all the stakeholders together across industries to address both gender and race-based wage gaps. The committee held five focus groups with stakeholders to get critical feedback that, the inform that informed the final commitment, and this was that employers understand the gender and race-based pay equity issue, that they take the time to analyze the information and also analyze the policies that may actually contribute and create pay disparities act on implementing the solutions, and share best practices. First Lady Ginther mentioned that our goal was 25 employers as of 20, end of 2017, and we were thrilled to reach 60 and since then have surpassed that mark. We look forward to working with all of the employers on their journey towards pay equity and encourage other employers to sign. You can find the commitment sheet for signing at www.columbus.gov slash pay equity. This is just the beginning. Our next steps actually include now looking at best practices and helping companies implement the pledge. We thank you for your support. We look forward to sharing more exciting stories such as what Councilmember Tyson has shared today of how this is making an impact in our community. Thank you. As I read the title of our next resolution, I'd like to invite Elaine Roberts to the podium, please. We have resolution 0304X-2017 to commend and thank Elaine Roberts for her outstanding service to the City of Columbus as the President and CEO of the Columbus Regional Airport Authority. Elaine Roberts began serving as Executive Director of the Columbus Airport Authority in December of 2000 and became President and CEO of the Columbus Regional Airport Authority when it was formed in 2003. Under her leadership and guidance, Central Ohio's aviation sector has advanced tremendously over the past 17 years. From the merging of two separate airport authorities to the growth of Rickenbacker into a cargo hub that supports more than 54,000 jobs, to more than $1 billion invested in airport infrastructure, Columbus is clearly in a stronger position thanks to Elaine Roberts' work. 
We've seen big changes at the airport, like its renaming to John Glenn Columbus International Airport and an $80 million terminal re renovation that resulted in recognition as the 2016 most improved airport in North America. But we've also seen smaller and very important changes at the airport, like the addition of private nursing rooms throughout the terminal and the free uh, feminine hygiene products for travelers. With changes big and small, the Columbus Regional Airport Authority has been unwavering in its focus to provide passengers, businesses, and the community with the highest level of service. Elaine Roberts has been recognized nationally as past chair of the American Association of Airport Executives, as well as locally as a woman of achievement by the YWCA and a recipient of the Riveter Award from WELD, Women for Economic and Leadership Development. Her legacy at the Columbus Regional Airport Authority and in the community will continue to be felt long after your retirement. And for that, we are all truly thankful. Uh, before I move for adoption, I want to see if my colleagues have any comments. Wonderful, wonderful, I move for adoption. Second. Brown Harden, Paige Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, uh, President Klein, uh, uh, Chairwoman Brown, and members of con uh, council. You're not Congress yet, I guess, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is truly an honor. Um, was not expecting this at all, and it's been my true privilege to serve in this role for 17 years. Uh, I've, I pride myself on and believing I'm a public servant, and our airports are public assets, and so anything I could do to make them a, a great front door to our community has been something I've worked very hard to do. Um, I've lived here longer than any place else I've ever lived. I'm uh, retiring to a little warmer temperature, but will miss Columbus very, very much. It's my favorite city in eight states I've lived, and I just want to thank you very much. This has been a truly welcoming city since I've moved here at the end of 2000, and I've watched the city grow, and I, I'm excited about its future. I know there's some great things to come uh, with all the development, both downtown as well as the airport, with plans for a future terminal. And we're leaving, uh, I'm leaving things in very, very good hands. We've got a great team. Regardless of who the future leader is, I know uh, everything will keep moving forward to represent the city well. So thank you so much uh, for this very special honor. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, I do want to just introduce um, Sahir Rama, who is uh, shadowing me today. He is a 1L at Moritz and um, is shadowing me for the meeting before he drives home to Mason for the Thanksgiving holiday. So welcome. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight I have a resolution. I would like to follow that with an announcement. I have a resolution 0306X-2017, and I would like to invite Marilyn Tomasi, Vice President of Public Affairs from the Mid-Ohio Food Bank, as well as Sophia Fifner, Community Relations Chief from Recreation and Parks, to the podium. And this resolution that we have this evening is to commemorate the Empty Bowls Project on fighting hunger in our communities for 20 years. And I'm going to allow Marilyn and Sophia to talk more about the, about the program, but we definitely just appreciate the work that you both are doing. And I would just like to let everyone know that the citizens of Columbus commend the Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, their community partners, Middle Ohio Food Bank, and Empty Bowls for their continued dedication to the community and support in combating hunger in Central Ohio. So at first, like to move for adoption. Second. Brown? Yes. Harden? Yes. Page? Yes. Stunziano? Yes. President Klein? President Pro Tim Tyson? Yes. Resolution adopted. Thank you. Sophia and Marilyn, the floor is now yours. Councilmember Page, President Klein, Pro Temp Tyson, and members of City Council, thank you so much. My name is Sophia Fefner. I am the Community Relations Chief for Columbus Recreation and Parks, and today we'd like to talk about the resolution in honor for Empty Bowls. This is the 20th year Columbus Recreation and Parks has partnered with other local organizations, including churches and businesses for Empty Bowls, a program that raises funds for the Mid-Ohio Food Bank. Thus far, we've raised more than 230 
$186,000 for the program, and we're hoping that this year we can top $250,000. Volunteers create handcrafted bowls throughout the year. These bowls are then filled with soup and sold at one of our Empty Bowls locations for a minimum donation of $10. You can support Empty Bowls still at, by joining us at Winterfest. It's our first annual uh, Winterfest. It's Saturday, December 2nd at Bicentennial Park from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The CRPD food truck, I'm sure you've seen it around town, will be selling these Empty Bowls um, with a donated soup from our signature food partner, Milestone 229. Winterfest will feature live music, including a special performance from DJ RJD2 and local artist Angela Perley and the Howlin' Moons and Doc Robinson. You can grab a bite to eat at one of the eight local food trucks who will be on hand to enjoy seasonal beer and local craft brewery. The best part is a portion of the food truck and boots beer sales will be donated to Mid-Ohio. It is just one way of inviting the community to help combat hunger in Central Ohio, and you can find more information about this at thesciotamile.com. So again, thank you so much for the recognition and the honor for this wonderful program to fight hunger in Central Ohio, and more importantly, celebrate the season of giving here in Columbus. Thank you. We uh, just want to say on behalf of all of our hungry neighbors right here in Columbus, Ohio, in Central Ohio, thank you to the City of Columbus and thanks to the Recreation and Parks Department for their incredible efforts with this Empty Bowls program. You know, um, Sophia had mentioned that uh, this year we helped to raise $250,000 that what represents almost a million meals because for every one dollar donated we can get four meals out of each one of those dollars and we can't forget that one in four children in our community does not know where their next meal is coming from so thank you councilwoman page for introducing this resolution and again um, and especially during this giving season we are incredibly grateful to your efforts thank you thank you marilyn and sophia are there any additional comments from my colleagues CNN, again, thank you. And President Klein, I do have one more announcement. And as Marilyn was saying, as we are in this season of thankfulness, I would like to ask Mr. Tom Merritt, Chair of the Champions for Play Committee, and William White. Champions for Play Committee spokesperson to come down to the podium. And both of these men have been doing amazing things throughout our city to help provide opportunities for some of our youth who, maybe the same youth who are suffering from hunger, to have a great summer experience and to be able to take part in our Columbus Recreation and Parks programs. They coordinate the Champions for Play annual fundraiser, and I'll give you both the opportunity to speak a little bit more about that and to encourage everyone to come out next year on May 7th. So thank you both for join us and again thank you so much for the work that you're doing <clears throat> thank you council member page uh, council president kennedy and other i'm sorry klein see i've been it's been i'm in i'm i'm, I'm in this retro thing you know it's been a long time since i've been here so i'm i'm stuck i'm sorry john used to give me a lot of grief when i was up here so i apologize for that um council president klein and members of council um you know, we approach, uh, we're joined tonight by Carl Kennedy, who's with Kokosing, and um, uh, together with William White, our, our captain uh, for, the, for the team that represents the play outing. Um, we, we're a team, team event, we're a team sponsored group there, and we work really hard to raise money for children in Columbus. I'm proud to say over the last 23 years, we've raised over a million dollars and have donated over a million dollars to children in Columbus who uh, need and want to participate in fee-based programming through recreation and parks, but can't afford to. So we're giving them an opportunity to do, do something uh, that hopefully changes their lives. In 2017, we donated, uh, we raised and contributed over 73 million, I'm sorry, $73,000 uh, to grants to provide those opportunities for children. And um, we've been involved in the program for 23 years, and in the last three years we've partnered with the um, Urban and Shelley Meyer Foundation to try to increase our awareness and get more uh, participation in the event, which we have been doing um, lately over the last three years. 
Um, just uh, want you to know the event is scheduled for May 7th. You receive the uh, save the date cards. I do appreciate all of your support as well as the support of the other members of the city. And um, I want to thank you for this recognition and certainly encourage uh, you to continue to s support the uh, programming through recreation and parks. William? Well, the only thing I'd like to uh, say is raising the $73,000 and uh, having benefit 4,000 kids is really great, but we need more. So uh, your presence there May 7th would really help and go a long way because the more money we can uh, raise for the kids, the better it will do. Um, in my background, I, I know those kids very personally because I, I grew up in that kind of neighborhood from Lima, Ohio, and I know the more you have support and mentors and things that you can do, uh, the more access to just not your home. You know, when you're living in those homes, they don't know what the real world is like. They just know what the hood is like. So the more opportunities we can give them, the better off it is for the kids. So my goal this year is to be able to give like $100,000 and help support six or 7,000 kids. So the more we can have you guys come out and help support us, the better it is. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Michael and Carl as well. That's all I have, President Klein. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight I have three brief announcements. Uh, first, I'd like to remind everyone that the online application for small businesses and Columbus organizations to apply for changing stations is live and currently accepting applications. A few small businesses have already applied and received theirs and they even sent a photo of it. So if anyone is interested, uh, please visit www.columbus.gov slash changing station to apply. Also want to thank my colleagues for their ongoing support, either for sharing that information on social media, uh, but also for the ordinance. Uh, second, I would uh, like to share that tomorrow we'll be holding a public hearing to highlight the age-friendly uh, Columbus initiative in our city. Uh, this citywide initiative has been working to ensure that all individuals of all ages and abilities can remain in their neighborhoods and live a high quality of life independently. Uh, representatives from the City of Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, I believe Director Collins will be there, uh, Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and senior community leaders will be on hand to present information about the initiative, uh, the work we've done the past two years. I know Fran Ryan uh, will also be there. So place to be tomorrow, Tuesday, November 21st at 3 p.m. at the J.C. Arms Apartment Complex located at 266 East Main Street. And finally, I don't see him. I was looking for George Walker. I don't see Mr. Walker, but for those colleagues that don't know, Mr. Walker is actually resigning, uh, retiring, if you will, from the South London uh, Area Commission. And so was going to have him down to recognize all his work and commitment for that community. And I know we've all enjoyed our ability to collaborate and work with him. With that, no other comments. Thank you, President Klein. Thank you, President Klein. I have resolution number 0308 XTES 2017. And as I begin to read this resolution, I am going to ask all the World AIDS Day attendees to walk towards the podium, please. This resolution is to recognize World AIDS Day, which is December the 1st and to encourage Columbus Public Health and its dedicated community partners to continue their efforts to serve and to alleviate issues related to HIV, AIDS, and other STDs. Whereas World AIDS Day was launched in 1988 by the World Health Organization as one of the eight global public health campaigns created to raise international awareness regarding a pandemic that has claimed more than 35 million lives. Whereas more than 2,200 residents have died from HIV or AIDS complications in the state of Ohio since the epidemic began. And whereas more than 21,000 Ohioans live with HIV with more than 4,600 residing in Franklin County. And whereas HIV and AIDS continue to plague communities across the state of Ohio, 199 new cases were reported in 2016. And whereas a racial disparity exists as African Americans have an HIV AIDS rate, which is 3.7 times higher than whites. Whereas the city of Columbus expresses its appreciation for the strong partnerships which exist between the Ohio AIDS Coalition, Columbus Public Health, Equitas Health, the FACES Clinic at Nationwide Children's Hospital, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, 
and the OSU Student Wellness Center who have come together on World AIDS, who will come together on World AIDS Day to continue the crusade to diminish and raise awareness about this disease. Whereas the City of Columbus also embraces its obligation to mitigate this issue for the public health and welfare of its citizens. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus if this council does hereby recognize World AIDS Day and adopt this resolution to raise awareness in the city of Columbus and encourage, and encourage Columbus Public Health and its committed community partners to continue their efforts to serve and alleviate issues related to HIV, AIDS, and other STDs. And then I move for adoption. Brown, Harden, Page, Tanziano, Tyson, President Klein. I want to thank you, President Klein. And City Council, but I want to make a special note to Ms. Tyson. When we were in our auditor out in the hallway getting our pictures taken, I noticed the eloquent way you spoke about HIV and the history of it. I, being positive for 32 years, knew when it wasn't talked about as eloquently as you spoke about it. The truth and honesty that you presented, which is why this World AIDS Day is a little bit different. We are no longer going to be sorrowful, not that we're not sorrowed by the losses, but this year we want to celebrate the life and those living with HIV. And in doing this, we may destigmatize HIV and make it something that we can talk about openly and we can eradicate the disease. The theme this year is honoring the past and embracing the future. We'll have presentations of dance, song, poetry, and an expression of love, hope, and possibility for the future. We as organizations have traveled a journey of separation and, and fighting for money, and we've come together, and we're asking everybody to come together as well. Everybody's welcome, and I thank you for the opportunity. And please state your names as you're coming to the podium. Who you represent? I'm Greg Cody, and I represent Equitas Health. Thank you so much. I'm Kim Regis, and I, rec um, and I represent Nationwide Children's Hospital. Thank you, President Kine and President Pro Tem um, Tyson. Thank you so much for this resolution. Um, on behalf of Nationwide Children's Hospital and the community, um, we have worked with the city of Columbus for a long time to provide care for families. and. Where we are today is a shining example of when you partner with families and you take a strategic approach to provide care for their present condition, whatever it may be, and in this case, HIV AIDS, and you provide them resources and you address the social determinants of health. You, you provide resources to address the health concern and then you are able to provide resources to address poverty and food insecurity and all those things that people can thrive and survive and overcome. And then you can remember the past and celebrate their future and they have a future to look forward to. So I just wanna thank you for celebrating that and recognizing that and that people when given the proper resources, they can overcome and become everything that they are and that their diagnosis does not define them. So thank you for recognizing that and we appreciate it. My next resolution um, is bittersweet. Uh, it's resolution 0312X-2017. And I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Teresa Long and the team from Columbus Public Health uh, to please walk to the podium, please. This resolution is to recognize, applaud, and to thank Dr. Teresa C. Long, MD, MPH, for the 31 years of service that she has rendered to the residents of Columbus and Central Ohio. Whereas Dr. Teresa Long 
uh, a California native, has, has devoted more than 31 years of her time to serving the residents of Columbus, Ohio, Columbus and Central Ohio, 15 of those as a health commissioner at Columbus Public Health. And whereas Dr. Dr. Long holds a Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and a Master's of Public Health from the University of California at Berkeley. And whereas Dr. Long's career has come to be defined by her commitment to excellence and her willingness to serve others. Dr. Long is a 2010 YWCA Woman of Achievement awardee. She was recognized by the Columbus Business First in 2009 as a Newsmaker of the Year for her leadership and management managing H1N1 pandemic in Central Ohio. She was acknowledged by the International Association of Business Communicators as the 2010 Communicator of the Year, and the Columbus Business First recognized her as one of its 20 people in healthcare that you should know. She also was the first, health, first female health commissioner in the city of Columbus. Whereas Dr. Long's career has included serving on the front lines of the emerging AIDS epidemic with the, with the San Francisco Department of Public Health, a commitment which continued during her tenure in Columbus. And whereas Dr. Long will be remembered for her work to reduce an opiates epidemic which has been ravaging our state, she helped to lead efforts in 2015 to launch Care Safe Point and a, a comprehensive reduction partnership led by Equitas Health to address heroin opiate use and was part and was part of a strategy implementation process for services at Safe Point, which include intervention, assessment, treatment and counseling, testing, HIV, Hep C testing, and a linkage referral to care, syringe access, and the dispensing of naloxone at, at risk to at-risk individuals and their family support systems. Whereas Dr. Long has served as a Columbus Health Commissioner since her appointment in 2002, and since that time she's provided steady leadership and guidance during critical public health is issues such as a HIV, H1N1 pandemic, Ebola, Zika, the opiate crisis to protect the health and safety of residents. She has been at the forefront to reduce smoking by leading the Smoke Free Columbus and developing Tobacco 21 to eliminate tobacco sales to young people in order to reduce approximately 90% approximately of new smokers from the starting the dangerous and addictive habit. And moreover, Dr. Long distinguished public health career exemplifies a lifetime of passion and service and action to protect the health, safety, and the lives of residents of Columbus and Central Ohio. She also has been focused on access to health care for all of our residents. She's also been a champion for women's health. She's also been a champion for reducing infant mortality. And she's also been a champion for making sure that we reduce the disparities of health. It has truly been an honor and a privilege to work with you, Dr. Long. And be it resolved by this council of the city of Columbus, this council is hereby recognized, applaud, and thank Dr. Teresa C. Long, MD, MPH, for the 31 years of service that she has rendered to the residents of Columbus and Central Ohio. I move for adoption. Brown, Harden, Page, Stendiano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. My colleagues want to make any comments, additional comments to Dr. Long? I'm not sure <laughs> President Pro Tem, I would just like, I want to recognize Dr. Long for your wonderful service in the medical community, but specifically here in the city of Columbus. I've had the pleasure to work with you on numerous occasions, most recently uh, both in the trauma-informed care piece as well as the opioid space, uh, and that you've been in, uh, a willing partner from a council executive branch standpoint, and I appreciate uh, the efforts that we've done and the, the very significant and important and lasting impression that you've left on the city of Columbus. Thank you so much for your service. I Thank found you, a stethoscope when I was cleaning out. I was going to bring it to you. <laughs> so the, the, I told Dr. Long when we were we did a couple media appearances together that she needed to wear her stethoscope, and she never showed up with her stethoscope. <laughs> so oh, I, I thought for sure that you would bring it tonight. Maybe you can bequeath it to it. me. <laughs> Dr. Long, uh, I would just say that I've had the opportunity to work with you for now a, a very long time, and you've always been very cool, calm, and collected, uh, 
and when we're solving big issues in our community. And I really respect that. I've never seen you get flustered uh, and just have appreciate your friendship. But now I'm going to allow you to make some comments. Um, this is bittersweet for us. But. Well, thank you very much, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, and Council Member Brown. I'm missing Council Member M. Brown, but uh, Councilman Hardin, Councilman Page, Councilman Stinziano. This has been, thank you, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and of course, I can't see him from here, but I know he's there, Auditor Dorian. Thank you, <laughs> and to our treasurer, and of course, to our, our first assistant city attorney, uh, Josh Cox, and to all of my esteemed colleagues that I really can't see, and I promise I won't go on because everybody wants to get on, um, but thank you. Um, it has been an amazing, amazing opportunity um, for a young girl from San Francisco, a relatively young physician, let's go back, um, to who was willing to listen, to learn, um, wanted to help, and to make a difference. Um, it has, my career has been filled with remarkable teammates, and you see some of them here. They are remarkable, as well as you all are teammates. Uh, this is, of course, a team sport of public health and trying to create those conditions in which people can be healthy and to protect health and improve lives. The issues have been many. My bookended career with HIV and AIDS, uh, it's why I came here, uh, was to set up programming. We have done amazing work around HIV and AIDS, but the shame and the stigma still are real there, and here we are bookending it with opiates and the issues of shame and stigma, along with very complex multifactorial issues, and our approach has to be that smart, that, um, that compelling, that comprehensive. So it's interesting to have that along the way. We've dealt with food, and we all like to eat, and tobacco, and chronic disease, and the health of infants, the health of children, the health of women and families, and dads and older adults. It has been an amazing, amazing opportunity. Um, I would just share one thing, and that is, I've been talking a lot recently, uh, besides cleaning out my office, um, that there are two kinds of nations, two kinds of communities, states, provinces that have been recognized. And some of you heard this before, but I'll share it because I think it's so telling that the United Nations says that nations that are WIT, W-I-T-T, or we're in this together nations, do far better as far as their use of economic resources, their life expectancy, their infant mortality, and their overall health, as opposed to nations that are yo-yo or Y-O-Y-O, -Y -O, you're on your own. And it's feeling like there's a lot of yo-yo around these days. So I wanted to share with you that I believe this is a wit community. Wit will win, um, but we need to do everything we can together. And so there has been an amazing opportunity to work with you, to work with other community elected officials, our county elected officials. They think I work for them too, so that's good. Um, but in fact, trying to have all of us be together because we will not be nearly as successful unless we can work together on these social determinants of health. And each of you are passionate about different aspects and I think collectively. So the more that we can become that wit and try and let the yo-yo or maybe change that yo-yo that might be going on, whether it's in Washington or other places, so much the better. And just to close, it's been an amazing journey. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share it with you and your predecessors. Uh, it's a team sport. Um, Public health is a marathon. For me, the 31 years has felt like a sprint, but nonetheless, and there have been, again, lots of sprinting around infectious disease outbreaks and, and you named Ebola, Zika, et cetera. But we have an amazing team right here. Um, and I think you know them all, but they're amazing. And they will be led by a most remarkable leader, Dr. Mashika Roberts. She will do an extraordinary job, but please, be in it together with her, with them, with all of our residents. They will help, they will support. Our residents will inspire and motivate us, but you too are so key to be a part of that team. So with that, I wish you every success. Thank you for the opportunity. And I always leave my phone messages with, what have you done for your good health today? Because it starts with you. So I encourage you to take care of your good health as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Oh.
cer certainly um, for her to have dedicated 31 years of her life to this community, um, she couldn't have done it without her family. And I think her husband is here. She wants to acknowledge her husband. Well, first, and her I want daughter. to both say thank you to Nancy Bechtel, to Mike Fielding, to Keith Crin, to Roger Cloran, to Amanda Hagens, to Kelly Myers, to Terry Ambrose. Terry also is retiring as of the 30th. Who are you going to call? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mashika Roberts, to Audrey Reagan, and to Rebecca Nelson. They are amazing. And then there's my husband, Tom, Tom DeNoon. I'm sorry that my daughter, Catherine, couldn't join us tonight. But he has also given all those years to, oh, now I'll lose it, to all of our community and to all of you. So thank you, Tom. Um, it's a team sport, including our family. Thank you. I have um, an announcement and two announcements actually. The first announcement is um, the Affordable Care Act um, or the Obamacare open enrollment sign up period is underway. In fact, it began on November 1st, it will end December the 15th. This means that you do not, if you do not have health care coverage, you'd like to have it in 2018, then now is the time to sign up for coverage, which will begin January 1 of 2018. Um, you can um, go log on to healthcare.gov, or if you have any questions, 1-800-318-2596. And then, um, the last is just, I want to make, give us some, um, just to thank Mr. Dorian, that if you can recall that we had an ordinance that was on recently that we were doing a um, refunding, and it was ordinance number 20, 2660. And again, we were going out to, um, to refund, to do a refunding of this, to be able to save us money here in the city of Columbus. And the savings that, um, that Mr. Dorian um, was able to get for us was um, $12.2 million in savings. And the present value of those savings is $10.4 million. And so I want to thank Mr. Dorian for um, bringing this legislation to this body, resulting in a major savings for the city of Columbus. And then I also want to just share that the changes that are going to happen at the federal level in regards to um, this tax plan certainly does, can have a negative effect on our community will have a negative effect on our community. From earned income tax credits to um, the um, credits for us in terms of, um, I think my, this, Dr. Long's got me, the, um, uh, if we're investing, I can't, L, the LITH, I can't even think of the, Low income, ta long income housing credits, thank you. Um, but also, um, a transaction like we just, what I just mentioned for Mr. Dorian, we won't be able to do this. So Mr. Dorian, would you please kind of give, share some information about how the new proposed tax bill will um, harm us in regards to refunding? Uh, thank you. Uh Chairwoman Tyson and all council members. Uh, as Ms. Tyson indicated, we saved uh, present value savings about $10.5 million on that particular deal. We've done these refinancings many, many times over the years, uh, but with the new tax bill, uh, we will not be allowed to uh, refund any of the city's debt uh, prior to its call date. Um, when interest rates uh, move in the right direction, we take advantage of them. And I would say uh, the last change in the tax law that affected this type of financing was in 1986. And even though I don't have the number in front of me today, I feel very comfortable in saying we've saved at least $100 million by uh, refinancing these various city bonds over those, uh, those years. So unfortunately, uh, this, if the tax bill passes, as it ha has at least through the Congressional Committee uh, committees so far, 
uh, this will be the last of such savings you will see. Um, the bottom line of all of it is simply that your Columbus citizens will pay a lot more money for their infrastructure than uh, presently allowed. So thank you for support over all these years and in this particular ordinance. Uh, we, and I also want to thank the uh, uh, Department of uh, uh, Finance. Uh, Mr. Lombardi and his colleagues were very, very uh, collaborated in this effort. So I thank them all and I thank you. Thank you, Otto Dorian, and thank you to um, Director Joe Lombardi. All right, that's all I have in my committee, my uh, announcements, President Klein. Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson. Are there any other comments, Mr. Dorian, you'd like to offer? Okay. Treasurer's office, city attorney's office. I don't see any members of the judiciary here, but welcome our members of the area commission. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, at this time, I'd like to remove the following ordinances from the consent action portion of the agenda. 2853-2017 and 2967-2017 in Health and Human Services and 2908-2017 in the Judiciary. Uh, do my colleagues have any other uh, requests for removal of ordinances or resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, we now have a motion to waive second reading, I'm sorry, waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Harden, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Will you now read into the record, Clerk, uh, the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Economic Development Committee, ordinances 2933, 2934, 3014, and 3015-2017. Environment Committee, ordinances 2533 and 2960-2017. Education Committee, ordinance 2811-2017. Administration Committee, ordinances 2631 and 2659-2017. Public Service and Transportation Committee, ordinances 2867, 2875, and 2942-2017. 2017 Recreation and Parks Committee ordinances 2871 and 2946-2017 Public Utilities Committee ordinances 1838 2437 2558 2648 2725 2744 2778 2782 2783 2788 2795 2798 2803 2805 2829 2835 2851 2855 2862 2868 2873 2878 2883 2885 2889 2893, 2899, 2905, 2909, 2914, 2916, 2922, 2924, 2927, 2940, 2952, 2957, 2981, dash 2017, Judiciary and Court Administration Committee, Ordinance 2459, dash 2017. Thank you, Clerk. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent. Uh, will you now read into the ordinance numbers of each of the record? Resolutions of Expression 295X300, X307, X294, X298, X301, X303, X314, X315, X309, X310, X and 311, X-2017. Finance Committee Ordinances 2251, 2650, 2682, 2750, 2772, 2808, 2846, 2859, 2863, 2876, 2882, and 3013 2017. Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 2781, 2841, 2861, 2879, 2884, 2886, and 2888 2017. Economic Development Committee Resolution 278X, 279X, and 282X 2017. Ordinances 2640, 2732, 2911, 2936, 2937, 2994. Administration Committee Ordinance 2866 and 2965-2017, Public Safety Committee, Ordinances 2633, 2810, 2858, 2910, 2913, 2915, 2923, 2974, and 2984 2017. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 1716, 2101, 2680, 2792, 2812, 2828, 2830, 2832, 2872, 2896, 2918. 2919, 2920, 2951, and 2959 2017. 
Small and Minority Business Development Committee Ordinances 2710 and 2763-2017. Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinances 2373, 2673, 2675, 2843, 2928, and 2945-2017. Housing Committee Resolution 297X-2017 and Ordinances 2771, 2773, 2797, 2880, 2881, 2897, 2898, 2929, 2930, 2931, and 2947 2017. Technology Committee Ordinances 2543, 2691, 2698, 2799, 2833, 2925, and 2956 2017. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 2260, 2526, 2550. 2634, 2636, 2643, 2714, 2733, 2740, 2745, 2775, 2776, 2786, 2834, and 3019 2017. Judiciary and Court Administration Committee Ordinance 2887. 2017 and appointments from the mayor's office numbered A0182 and A0183 2017. Thank you, Clerk. I don't see any consent action speakers this evening. So, may I have a motion for approval of items designated as consent? So Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Consent action portion of the agenda carries. We'll now proceed to the Finance Committee. President Pro Tem chairs that committee. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Have ordinance number 2508-2017 is to authorize and direct the finance and management director to enter into two universal term contracts for the option to purchase electric vehicles with Reichert Properties Incorporated doing business as Reichert Ford Inc. and Buyer Chevrolet to enter into a universal term contract for an option to lease electric vehicles with an option to purchase with Mike Albert Fleet Solutions to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to authorize the expenditure of $3 to establish these contracts. These contracts will be in place for, for three years with the option to renew one for a one year additional year upon mutual agreement by both parties approval by Columbus City Council. The current plan is to obtain 91 electric vehicles for various city agencies such as code enforcement, facilities management, and fire. Uh, these vehicles are, are part of the 2016 when the city of, city of Columbus, acting through the Department of Public Service, pursued and were awarded the $10 million grant from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation in connection with the Smart City Challenge sponsored by the U.S. Department of Transportation. The purpose of the Smart City Grant is to enable the city to lay a practical path to replacing carbon-based fuel consumption through critical service improvements that increase safety, reduce the carbon emissions, and enhance uh, mobility. I see that uh, Mike Stevens is in council chambers. Certainly council member Harden has been leading this effort on, on smart cities. And I don't know if you want to make any comments, council member Harden, but I'll first ask director Lombardi to speak on this legislation because it does waive competitive bidding and, and certainly talk about the relationship that we will have with the Mike Albert fleet solutions. Director, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson, President Klein, Council Member Hardin, and other members of Council. Uh, this is a unique situation for the City of Columbus. Uh, we have established three contracts. Two of those contracts with buyers in Reichert will be for the purchase of electric vehicles. And the contract we set up with Mac Mike Albert Fleet Solution is to have a one year lease for these 91 vehicles. Uh, the City um, intends to save approximately $72,000 by leasing these vehicles. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Dorian for his input as we approached him about the option to lease. Um, we'll be able to buy these vehicles after that one year lease. So um, the savings will be from the federal credit that the dealership gets. They have passed that on to us in the pricing. The reason why we are waiving competitive bids is that we um, had, to re had to negotiate some terms and conditions for that lease. Uh, our city attorney's office has reviewed them and has accepted those. So that's why we are waiving competitive bids because we had to accept some terms and conditions as part of the lease. 
And direct my understanding is once when we when we're ready to purchase these vehicles, the cost because of the credits will be less than what the cost would have been to purchase the vehicles mm -hmm. outright. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and if I could just note also the two contracts that you can actually purchase vehicles, we established those so that other entities outside the city of Columbus could buy off those as as part of our Smart Cities Challenge, we wanted to make this open for other uh, entities uh, like our suburban partners. Thank you, Director. Councilmember Hardin, would you like to make any comments on this legislation? Thank you, President Pro Tim. Just wanted to uh, applaud you and uh, the Department uh, uh, for Finance and Fleet for this deal. Um, it really does make sense for the city, um, and it's unique, uh, and, and the work that was put into it to get us there and to really save money on behalf of the uh, the citizens, but also set us up for a more carbon-free or ca reduced carbon um, future is much appreciated. Uh, so thank you, uh, President Pro Tem Tyson and Director. Again, thank you for your leadership. And the total estimated expenditure is $3 million. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2590-2017 is to authorize the finance and management director on behalf of fleet management to establish purchase orders from a universal term contract with the Fleet Albert Leasing Inc. for the lease purchase of plug-in battery and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $1,732,955.76 from the Special Income Tax Fund and to authorize the expenditure of $273,000 from the Smart City Private Grant Fund and to declare an emergency. And this, this piece of legislation is to actually purchase the vehicles and authorizes the, the Director of Finance and Management on behalf of Fleet Management to establish purchase orders with the Fleet Albert Leasing. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2743-2017 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract with SGM Matrix LLC for security system parts, installation, maintenance, and monitoring, repair, and support services for various city facilities to weigh the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to authorize expenditure of $40,000 from the general fund and $10,000 from the available balance on the current auditor certificate to declare an emergency for a total of uh, $50,000. And director, do you want to uh, share why we're waiving competitive bidding on this piece of legislation? Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson, President Klein. Uh, this contract is to allow us to continue to upgrade our security system at various buildings. Um, the system itself is, um, is provided by uh, SGI Matrix. And that includes um, some of the control uh, modules, the badge readers that we use uh, throughout the city. This is to help protect not only our employees, but also the uh, residents who visit our buildings. Uh, so to keep consistent with that system and that it's reading uh, all the right modules, uh, we wanted to stay with SGI Matrix. So that's why we are waiving competitive bids so that we can continue to upgrade our system. Thank you, Director. And not seeing any questions, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2770-2017 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with Train USA Inc. for HVAC controls replacement at the Columbus Police Academy to authorize the expenditure of $480,748 from the Safety Voted Bond Fund and to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. The existing HVAC control system at the police academy is beyond its useful life and as such the control infrastructure has become obsolete and is in need of an upgrade. The systems controls the functioning of the HVAC system at the police academy such as airflow, cooling, and hearting. And the existing system right now is being regulated by equipment with TRAN USA. And that is why we are going to waive competitive bidding on TRAN again. Is that correct? Director. 
Yeah, thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson, President Klein, other members of council. That is correct. We wanted to ensure that the equipment that is being used there, um, that we wanted to connect it to the controls that um, are the same manufacturer. So this is why we're waiting competitive bidding. Seeing no questions, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2865-2017. It is to authorize and direct the city auditor to provide for the transfer of $14,500,719 within the general fund and to transfer appropriations between objects in certain non-general fund departments and divisions to authorize and direct the city auditor to appropriate additional funds in the Recreation and Parks Operation and Extension Fund, the Public Service Private, private Construction Inspection Fund, Finance and Management's Print and Mail Services Fund, and Public Safety's E911 Fund to authorize and direct the City Auditor to appropriate $25,000 in the Neighborhood Initiatives Fund to the Health Department and to authorize and direct the City Auditor to transfer cash between the General Fund and Property Management Fund and to authorize and direct the City Auditor to reduce the, appro the appropriation in the Technology Service fund by $100,000 and to declare an emergency. As part of, the, as part of our 2017 third quarter review, review, financial review, the Department of Finance and Management identified surpluses and deficits in various object classes and several divisions. In order to properly align these appropriations with projected expenditures and allow for the and allow for the divisions to operate without interruption through the end of 2017, it is necessary to transfer these funds. If there are no questions or, po or questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Um, the next ordinance is ordinance number 3008-2017, and it is a um, request to table this indefinitely pending a public hearing. Brown, Adam Page, Stanziano, Tyson, oh. President Klein. Thank you. Thank you. The next ordinance is 3009-2017, request a table indefinitely pending uh, public hearings. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Ordinance number uh, 3010-2017, and I request to table this indefinitely pending public hearings. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I'd now like to move to Health and Human Services. Thank you. The ordinance number 2805-2017 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the Healthy Start Grant Program in the amount of $1,080,000 to authorize the appropriation of $1,080,000 from the unappropriated balance of the Health Department Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. The, health, the Healthy Start Grant Program en enables Columbus Public Health to conduct um, a home visiting care coordination program in Franklin County, focusing primarily on perinatal and infant, cl infant clients and their families. Um, this fund will serve 800 clients, of, of whom 400 are pregnant and 400 are parenting women and their infants up to the age of two years old who reside in Franklin County. Clients receive education on pregnancy, women's health, infant health, infant growth, development, safety, nutrition, immunizations, and breastfeeding, and safe sleep. This Healthy Start grant program is entirely funded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the City of Columbus did not have to generate or any revenue to require a city match. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2806-2017 to authorize the director of the Department of Health to enter into various contracts for the Health Start grant program to authorize expenditure of $316,750 from the Healthy, Healthy Health Department grant grant fund and to weigh the provisions of Columbus City Codes for competitive bidding and to declare an emergency. The contracts will go to Mount Carmel, the, the 
Decision Support Services, Inc., Ohio Health, and Moms to Be for a total of $316,750. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brian Hardin Page, Stinziano Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. If we now go to back to consent page 15 and 16, I'll, I'll read my last two um, uh, pieces of legislation. It's ordinance number 2853-2017 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health for the Creating Healthy Communities Grant Program in the amount of $135,000 to authorize the appropriation of $135,000 to the health department and the Ohio department and the health department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. This grant will utilize population-based strategies to address healthy eating, active living, smoke-free living with the goal of reducing chronic diseases. This Creating Healthy Communities Program works in a priority zip codes throughout the Columbus to address chronic disease health disparities. Uh, this program will be in the priority communities of Linden, the, the South Side, and the West Side. If there's no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brian Hardin Page, Stinziano Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And my final piece of legislation is ordinance number 2967-2017. It is to authorize and direct the Board of Health to increase and modify an existing contract with MedPro Waste D Disposal LLC for the maintenance of needle box containers through August 31st of 2020 and to authorize the expenditure of $12,000 from the Health Special Revenue Fund and to declare an emergency. Council, member, Council President Klein is a co-sponsor of this legislation and it is to ensure that um, that their current needle box, with needle box locations, and we, this, the needle box locations are so important in regards to our opioid epidemic. Um, we wanna make sure um, most of you probably read in yesterday's paper um, of the initiative of our harm reduction program and how important it's been to our community to be able to give um, needles to individuals in our community that have um, an op opioid addiction. And based upon that, by giving them the needles, they're able to reduce um, um, HIV and AIDS, Hep C. And so the current needle box locations that we have in our community are at Columbus Public Health on 240 Parsons Avenue, the John Maloney Center on 1905 Parsons Avenue, the Hilltop Brand, Library Branch at 511 South Hague, and the Near East Opportunity Center at 1055 Mount Vernon Avenue. And this contract will allow this company to again go and pick up you know, disposal of the needles and the related materials in those various box locations. If there are no other questions or comments. I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees this evening, Council Thank President, you, President Klein. Jim. The next committee is Economic Development. is chaired by Councilmember Brown. Chair Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight in Economic Development, we are starting with Ordinance 2664-2017 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into an Enterprise Zone Agreement with Hubbard High Acquisition LLC for a property tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a proposed total investment of approximately $51 million, of which approximately $14 million will be related to the construction of approximately 45,000 square feet of commercial office space and an additional $4.2 million will be related to the construction of 86 underground parking spaces in support of the office development and the creation of 30 net new full-time permanent positions and to declare an emergency. Uh, this ordinance creates an enterprise zone agreement for the redevelopment of the former Haiku restaurant site located at 800 North High Street in a 10-story, approximately 150,000 square foot mixed use, hotel, commercial office, and retail development. The 10-year 75% property tax abatement is being granted in consideration of the $51 million infrastructure investment, including the commercial office, jobs, and parking spaces mentioned in the title of the legislation. The, the new jobs are expected to earn between $16.62 and $28.85 hourly. 
This is moving as emergency legislation so that the beginning of construction on the project is not delayed. We have one speaker against the project, uh, Mr. Joe Motil. If you are here, if you can approach the podium. Hello, Mr. Motil. If you can say your name, your address, and if you're with any organization, you know the drill. You have three minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, President Klein, Chairwoman Brown, members of City Council, uh, Joe Motil, live at 167 West Cook Road, Columbus. After this council undoubtedly approves of this 10-year, 75%, $4.1 million tax abatement, you will have handed out over the last 25 months $167.9 million in tax abatements to some of the world's richest corporations, Central Ohio's wealthiest multi-million dollar development firms, and corporate Columbus businesses who reap record annual profits, and mostly all of whom, along with their affiliates, contribute generously to your campaign committees. And regardless of the outcry from the public on the unfairness of granting tax abatements in the most prosperous and risk-free development neighborhood in Columbus, the short north, you continue to place the burden of higher property taxes on the working middle class and senior citizens and reduce revenues to help educate our children. When is it gonna stop? Even the report you had commissioned stated that incentives were too high and unnecessary in the short north. It seems like every citizen in the city knows that this is wrong, but it conti you continue to grant tax abatements in the short north. What are you waiting for? Every single underutilized one-story building in the short north to be purchased by one of your campaign contributing developer friends so that they can get just one more tax abatement? Crawford Hoying does not need a tax abatement to succeed and make a profit on this project. And it is not the responsibility of our city government to pad their profit margin at the taxpayer's expense. Columbus, Ohio, or any other major city in this country was not built on whether or not a developer or corporation received a tax abatement or a TIF. It's past time to wipe out these unnecessary boundaries of risk-free development areas known as enterprise zones and commercial reinvestment areas and to redraw them where they are truly needed. And instead, let's start granting 10-year tax, tax abatements to potential homeowners who want to purchase abandoned and vacant homes in order to revitalize truly distressed neighborhoods. Let's give them to folks who truly need a break and stop giving them to the rich and powerful of this city who write your campaign contributions which, with their tax abatement savings. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Motel. You can have a seat. Thank you. Um, Director Shoney, uh, I want to highlight a couple things and ask for um, your comment and input on the development as well. Uh, one of the things uh, really highlighted from the third party that did the recent incentive study was the importance of um, commercial uh, office uh, incentives to continue growing our base of income tax in the city. Um, we are an income tax funded city, um, more and more so these days with uh, state law changes in particular. So if you could comment on the, um, despite the fact that we're still, uh, the form, the recommendations aren't formal, if you could comment on sort of the congruence between this project and what we saw in the recommendations so far. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Brown, uh, members of uh, City Council President Klein. Um, a couple things. One is um, this abatement is not a residential abatement. Uh, this abatement also is not on the hotel. This is purely on the office. Um, so what Mr. Motil was referring to was within the consultant's report from HRNA, they did an analysis that looked at the cost to construct different types of residential projects within four different neighborhoods within the city, and they compared what the revenues are coming off of those projects, um, what's typically generated in the market today in each of those markets. And they did find that for low-density residential in the short north, um, there is not um, a need for additional abatement in order to get those projects off the ground. They found that for mid-rise, think four stories to 12 stories, uh, projects that need structured parking, there is still a need for abatement, but not um, perhaps 100% 15-year abatement. And we are going through the process right now of developing some recommendations um, to come to council, we hope soon, um, uh, with how to implement those. 
Um, as it relates to this abatement, I think one of the things that's interesting in this abatement as it relates to the incentive study, if you'll recall from the incentive study, it demonstrated that all of our suburban neighbors are being much more aggressive than we are um, with office abatement. And in this case, we're actually um, only offering 10-year, 75 percent abatement. When you look at our suburban competitors in New Albany, Westerville, Hilliard, um, Dublin with the Bridge Park um, uh, the Bridge Park um, development. They're all offering 15-year, 100% abatement. Westerville's 15, or is 12 years, 100% abatement on commercial office. It is a highly competitive market. Now, the reason we're able to offer a little bit less incentive in the short north is because location does really matter um, for office. It is less of a commodity business than, say, warehouse or industrial. Thank you. Um, so the 10-year, 75% uh, property tax abatement is in consideration, particularly for that office space. And thank you for outlining the differences and the recommendations from the report. Are there other questions from my colleagues? Councilmember Cinziano. Thank you, Chair Brown. I appreciated uh, the explanation of how it fit into the abatement. Uh, just curious, generally, when we talk with our residents, how this is the best public policy or where this positions us well? So um, f the Short North is an interesting neighborhood on uh, a multitude of um, levels. One of the things that we are trying to balance in that neighborhood in particular is getting 24-hour use in the neighborhood in order to better support the, the, largely the retail business um, and to make it a place where you truly can live and work um, and have its own ecosystem uh, where you don't need to have the same kind of car-based economy that we have um, in most of our city today. So one of the important things for us is really balancing the residential use with office use. And that's why we're very excited about this project. Um, I was just driving through Short North today and saw that we're making a lot of progress on uh, Wood Company's uh, office project um, at Lincoln and High. Um, so we're excited about this project. Okay. Thank you, Director. Anything else from us? You good? Anything else? All right. I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Next, we have Ordinance 2821-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the City Auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the Development Taxable Bonds Fund to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Neighborhood Structured Parking Incentive Contribution Agreement with EF Garage, LLC, to authorize the expenditure of $2 million within the Development Taxable Bonds Fund and to declare an emergency. This agreement and expenditure support the construction of, 292, uh, of a 292 space structured parking garage. At least 200 spaces will be used for public parking. The garage is part of the River and Rich Project in East Franklinton. The project includes 50 units of workforce housing and 74 units of affordable housing out of 230 total units along with 28,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space. EF Garage LLC will make annual revenue sharing payments to the city through a special assessment on the property for a period of 30 years. Emergency action is being considered so the construction schedule is not disrupted. Are there questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Next, we have Ordinance 2822-2017 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into an economic development agreement with Wagenbrenner Development concerning the redevelopment of approximately 50 acres of real property located at the northeast corner of Dublin Road and Grandview Avenue and to declare an emergency. Mm -hmm. This project consists of the construction of approximately 200,000 square feet of Class A office space 900 multifamily housing units, a 260-unit senior living facility, 29,000 square feet of retail space, and a 120-unit hotel. Through the agreement, the City of Columbus will establish a tax increment financing district, a community reinvestment area, and an enterprise zone agreement at the project site that will each be considered by City Council in the future. These will be considered in recognition of a commitment from the developer to designate 
of the housing units as affordable at 100% of the area median income and 10% of the units as affordable at 80% of the area median income for a total of 180 affordable units at the site. The large capital investment and the jobs created through the construction of 200,000 square feet of new office space are important benefits under consideration in this agreement. Uh, we have a speaker in opposition to this ordinance, Mr. Joe Motil. Welcome back to the podium. President Klein, Chairwoman Brown, members of City Council, Joe Motil, 167 West Cook Road. My comments are based on news reports. I did not. I asked for some information on this specifically, but didn't get it till five o'clock. So uh, my remarks are made based on what I've read in the news. First of all, I think the quarry property that's being, and this relates to both this and the next one, since I can't speak, uh, is being required by Metro Parks will provide a really amazing opportunities for our residents and visitors to enjoy a rare scenic environment and also those who wish to physically utilize the park's natural conditions. I'm also somewhat pleased to read that the developers agreed to provide 10% of his units to those in the 80 to 100% median area income range, something that I've been advocating for for just over two years now, but let's make it 20%. Let's widen the income range and let's make it mandatory by establishing legislation for all new housing and apartment developments to help address our affordable housing crisis. But I don't agree with the other terms and conditions that are being proposed as a collaboration between Metro Parks, Columbus, Wagon, and Wagenbrenner. News reports have stated that Wagenbrenner has declined to provide any estimates for cleanup and construction costs. The developer has constructed housing and retail projects on several brownfield sites and has been crunching numbers on this project for no less than seven months. He's fully aware of the cost of the project. The taxpayers of Columbus deserve to know why they need 25 years worth of tax abatements and generous TIFs. And once again, generous tax abatements and other incentives are being extended to yet another risk-free development that will have the advantages of a well-maintained, extraordinary taxpayer-paid park at its doorstep. This agreement carries with it the stench of yet another smoke-filled backroom deal from a developer who's donated nearly a combined $45,000 to the mayor and members of the city council and has been given what he has asked for. Wagenbrenner's attorney claims that this project is not conceivable given the amount of money we're spending on environmental cleanup. Based on their 25 years worth of property tax savings, I'm guessing that they don't pay a dime for cleanup. They may even come out ahead on the deal. And if I'm wrong, prove it. It is totally inappropriate to give out any incentives whatsoever until the developer goes public with his cost for both cleanup and construction. And the taxpayers deserve to be told the monetary amount on how much of a tax savings the abatement will yield. Any tax incentives given to the developer this time are premature and irresponsible to the taxpayers of Columbus based on the lack of information that is being provided by the developer in the city council. And only after all information is provided should Mayor Ginther, council, and the director decide what, if any, incentives should be considered. So I'm asking that you table this legislation in the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martel. You can sit. Um, one of the things that's really remarkable about this project and the, the next one, I did not realize uh, how many sites in the city of Columbus were just dumping grounds in prior uh, predating laws around um, landfill and uh, public health and um, sort of trash distribution, if you will. And uh, people used to just dump into various areas of our city that were then on the outskirts. outskirts. And so we're left with um, really a land use and public health consideration as we um, you know, try to continue to, to remake our city into a, a 21st century attractive um, uh, great American city. So I appreciate the, the context uh, there. And uh, Director, if you could, uh, and both of these represent some, they're really, really dirty sites. Um, so Director, if you have any uh, comments in addition um, on this one, feel free to lead into the other one too, but. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Chair Brown, President Klein, um, members of council. 
Um, both of these projects are really very interesting projects. I'll start with the Grandview Crossing project, which is at the corner of Dublin Road and uh, Grandview. Um, if you've driven by there, you know what it is. It's that big empty site that they've been um, working on for years. This has it's gone through several iterations. Um, the developer had concentrated for a long time on doing purely retail at the site um, because of the geotechnical aspects of building on a landfill. Uh, they were able to acquire some additional land from, uh, I think it's CSX Railroad, um, to the back. That's where they're building the office. That change allowed for a project that we got a lot more excited about. Um, in addition, uh, the developer committed to um, going to 10 percent of units affordable to and rented to folks making 80 percent of area median income and below, and another 10 percent affordable to folks making 100 percent of area median income and below. Just in rough terms, kind of real people numbers, um, what does that mean in terms of income levels? That's families making forty to $60,000 a year. Um, middle, by definition, middle income, slightly below middle income families, and we're really excited about that. Um, and they're doing it in what is not a risk-free environment. Um, building on top of a landfill um, is about as not risk-free as you can find. Um, the Wagenbrenner uh, Development Company has figured out how to manage that risk, but it is an expensive process. Um, we believe that the abatement is perfectly appropriate. Okay, thank you. And we, we need to be able to use this land in our city and, um, and companies that can actually bring in the resources to clean it up and make it a safe place for people to work or live or play um, is pretty important. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Um, director, do you, do you have any ideas of uh, the cost to clean up properties like this? Um, it is expensive. I wish I could tell you off the top of my head. I mean, there, I, I wasn't around for when they did Gowdy Field. That's probably the most appropriate um, kind of comparison. I can tell you it'll be in the kind of upper seven figures um, for the quarry project. I'm not sure how much they spent on uh, uh, Grandview Crossing for the environmental. They went through a process of doing something called dynamic compaction on that site, which was essentially, um, it's a fancy way of saying you take a great big old weight and you drop it over and over and over and over uh, to compact the soils. Um, and that was a process that took them literally a year to get the soils compacted so that they could then build on top of that site. Um, so it is a very expensive way to build, but they're great sites, and they're sites that we believe can be really attractive. When you look at the work that um, uh, the Metro Parks and our Department of uh, Recreation and Parks, and Tony and his team have done on the quarry project, it is um, going to be potentially one of the great jewels of our city um, uh, when that Metro Park is finished. And I think the Wagenbrenners, um, ability to see that vision um, and assemble that deal together is something that it really is a, um, a huge benefit to our city. Okay. I think it's helpful for just our viewing and listening um, uh, audience to just have an, a kind of an understanding of how that process works. Because when you know, as you're just saying, the, the compacting, mm -hmm. I, I just feel like um, sometimes I think it may seem like it's an easy project yeah. to do. And, you know, the EPA is obviously very much involved. But can you, if you have that knowledge, I know that there are people in the audience that may have a little more yeah. knowledge about it, but if you have the knowledge, can you just kind of share what kind of goes into a project like this? Sure. It, it, it takes, first it starts with doing very detailed um, geotechnical analysis, drilling down, doing core samples on the site, understanding what's in the soil, um, understanding how deep of a cap there is on the site, um, oftentimes bringing in more clean fill to put on top of the site. Um, over the long term, it will mean decades and decades of monitoring. Uh, there will be monitoring wells at each of these sites um, for, I have no idea how long, I don't know, Tony, if you know, but um, decades to make sure that those remain clean and safe places for residents. Um, the Wagenbrenners have been working with um, the EPA on both of these projects um, for, uh, I know on the Grandview Crossing project, I've been here for four years, they've been working on that project for that period of time. Uh, I'm not sure how long they've been working with the quarry, but 
it is a multi-year long-term investment at, for which there is not a lot of certainty in terms of what the outcome is going to be from a regulatory standpoint until you get the final answer from the EPA because these are complex sites and there's not a lot of knowledge about what is in the ground on these until the developer does the work to do that exploration. They work very closely with Ohio EPA to make sure at the end of the day that these are exceptionally safe places um, and that we can move forward with confidence on these sites. But it is a long process. It's an expensive process, and it should be a long and expensive process. Yep. Any other questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. President Klein, I know it's 638. I have one more. Do you want me to do it now? Okay. Um, my last piece in economic development is Ordinance 3075-2017 um, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development and the Director of the Department of Recreation and Parks to enter into an economic development agreement with Wagenbrenner Development concerning the redevelopment of approximately 300 acres of real property located at the northeast corner of Dublin Road and Treby Road and to declare an emergency. Uh, we do have one speaker against this ordinance. If Ms. Uh, Rita Cabral could approach the podium as I uh, continue uh, to, to, to uh, speak about the ordinance. The project consists of the construction of approximately 20,000 square feet of Class A office space, 600 multifamily housing units, 440 single-family homes and condominiums, and up to 50,000 square feet of retail space on 80 acres of land. The developer will work in partnership with the city and Metro Parks to acquire 220 acres of green space and construct a unique urban Metro Park for the community on the remaining land at the site, including a public bike trail along the western side of the Scioto River. Through the agreement, the City of Columbus will establish a tax increment financing district, a community reinvestment area, and an enterprise zone agreement at the site, each uh, contingent upon review separately by City Council in the future. This will be considered in recognition of the establishment of the public park and the bike trail, a commitment from the developer to reserve up to 20% of the housing units in the development as affordable at 100% of the area median income or below, the substantial capital investment involved, and the new jobs created through the construction of 20,000 square feet of new office space at the site. If you know the drill, if you could state your name, please, uh, address, and if you have an affiliation. Yes, my name is Rita Cabral. Um, I live in Scioto Woods, which is part of the West Scioto Area Commission. And this evening, I am speaking as a resident. Uh, Chair, uh, Council Chair Brown, Council President Klein, Council President Pro Tem Tyson, and Council Members. Um, I have several questions. Has the Director of Development, Stephen Shoney, a member of Mayor Ginther's cabinet, ever contacted the West Scioto Area Commission regarding this matter? Another question. Has the Council Committee Chair Brown or any other of Columbus City Council ever contacted the West Scioto Area Commission regarding this matter? Another question, would it be true since the legislation text concerning this matter currently described approximately 20,000 uh, square feet of class A office space, 600 multifamily housing units, 440 single family, house, uh, family homes and condominiums and up to 50,000 square feet of retail space there is no intention of Mayor Ginther or City Council members to allow existing neighborhood residents residing in the West Scioto area commission boundaries opportunity to review, comment, or make recommendations concerning any necessary changes to existing land use and zoning. Another question. This proposed council legislation has no fiscal impact. Authorities uh, to city directors to enter into economic development agreement with Wagner Brother, uh, Wagner, Wagner Brunner Development. 
where and what are details of the economic development agreement, including outlining the plans and concern uh, commitments of both parties relating to the development, the framework for many of the major terms of cooperation, and the city's agreement to provide financial assistance. And finally, if the property to be developed is a brownfield site and currently owned by an active quarry business, shouldn't the current owner remediate environmental hazards on the property at their expense and not pass the burden onto the new owner or the City of Columbus residents? Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, so a couple things, um, uh, first being that th this is not a building permit. Um, this represents authorization to, um, to make some mutual commitments on um, specifically relating to um, financing the deal, uh, like we talked about with environmental cleanup. Um, so th this is, I just want to stress that this is not a building permit. Also, the last I spoke with the developer, um, they were scheduling to come in to see the West Scioto Area Commission to actually talk about the specifics of the development. Um, and I appreciate the question and um, acknowledge it too. Thank you. Um, the two other pieces I wanted to um, mention um, in terms of the current owner, that would be really great if they did the environmental remediation before they sold the site. Um, but un unfortunately, there is no um, financial incentive for them to do that. Uh, you know, they didn't buy it, con the site long ago, contingent upon then cleaning it up before reselling it. You know, I wish that, that were, there were that kind of land property stewardship um, that just happened, but it doesn't happen naturally until there is a financial incentive for someone to do it. Um, and that's really what this is about, instead of seeing the site languish um, we're going to be able to see it be redeveloped, and there, there needs to be some financial incentive to make that happen. Um, so I, I want to ask the director if he has uh, anything further to add. A um, uh, couple things. One is um, thank, you for the qu thank you for the questions. Um, the, uh, what I would like to do is, as you said, number one, this isn't um, – the formal zoning process that still has to go through a process. Um, what I would like to have you do is maybe next week sit down with a couple of members of my staff who have been very close to this project and walk through the various details that you talked about. In terms of the acquisition, I think Chairwoman Brown is um, correct in terms of the way these deals come together. Um, I don't, I, this one I'm not sure whether the quarry actually owned the landfill site or who Wagenbrenner is buying the landfill site from. But typically, the, the owner is not going to clean a site up because they don't know what the end use is going to be. So there are different levels of cleanup that go into different end uses. So it doesn't make sense for the prior owner to do the cleanup. It makes sense for the, the group that's going to be doing the use to do the cleanup. But I'd be happy to have um, my expert, the experts on my team walk you through that process and walk through all those issues with you. And any other members of the Area Commission as well. Yes, of um, that would be great. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? Yeah, Council Member Cinziano. Thank you, Chairwoman Brown. And similar to the question I asked two ordinance ago, why is this in the best interest of our residents and good policy? It's not very often um, that you get a chance to turn um, in this case. I mean, the, the previous project, we're turning into something that's a really good development, but a fairly standard kind of development that we look for. Um, it is not very often that you get to take what is an environmental liability and turn it into an environmental asset. Um, that's what's particularly special about this project. And uh, when you get a chance to tour the site, um, you get back in there and you open your eyes a little bit to what it can be. Uh, it doesn't feel like you're in central Ohio anymore. Um, it feels like you are in a different place where you have rock walls, where you can see uh, the potential to have um, an outdoor adventure park that is something truly special, not just for the city, not just for the region, not just for the state, but for the entire Midwest. And I think when you tie that together with the great investments that public service and rec and parks have made in our, bike wa our bikeways and our bike trails, it really does give us um, a really unique opportunity. Thank you. 
Council Member Harden. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Rita, for coming down. You know how much we love um, West Iota. Uh, and your, your engagement. Just wanted to remind you that there, this is the first in, in many steps, and so there will be uh, ample opportunity to engage and to give uh, feedback in um, as this project goes along. And knowing um, both you and, and the, 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 com uh, the commission, as well as um, the developer here, uh, I think that this will be, you, you will appreciate the relationship and the, the working relationship that will develop as this project moves along. And I look forward to, to working with you and being out um, as we, as we uh, go through those steps. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Pro Tem Tyson. Thank you, Chairwoman Brown. And lastly, I just really appreciate um, the commitment uh, in regards to our affordable housing. And uh, certainly we are a city that is in, um, desperate need for more affordable housing within our community and as we as we focus on the 80 percent ami and 100 percent ami um, it then frees up um, some of the work that certainly council member page is working on but this council in terms of affordable housing to be able to work with you director shoney um, and to um, providing more affordable housing units, not only for this group of individuals, but for individuals who are certainly um, at a lower income level. And so uh, this is important for that purpose also. Thank you. Thank you, Pro Tem. Are there other questions or comments? Thank you. And I, I uh, look forward to uh, truly the Area Commission um, engaging in uh, first of all, dialogue with the developer, but also this sort of imagination experiment that Director Shoney uh, mentioned. I remember our first meeting when we sat down and ate pizza together and uh, members of the uh, then soon to be area commission uh, saying, you know, what's, what's the vision for our area? And what you said to me is you wanted an area that had diverse opportunities, that it wasn't one kind of job or one kind of activity or one kind of, um, uh, residential opportunity and uh, there's that potential in this project um, to truly attract uh, uh, the region um, when it comes to an urban park there won't be a thing like it uh, Tim Maloney at, at Metro Parks can barely speak straight when he talks about the um, the possibilities here and really the jewel of their entire system uh, so we are thrilled that that possibility exists in right in our own city right in our own backyard and a mere 20 minute drive from less than 20 minutes sometimes from downtown. So um, any other comments from my colleagues? With that, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We're at 6.50. Uh, do you have any, I'm sorry, do you have any other business to come before the economic development? Do you? Okay. Uh, seeing that you don't, I apologize for jumping the gun there, Councilmember Brown. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick recess. Uh, if I can get a motion to recess, regular meeting number 55. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Uh, and we'll, as soon as the zoning chair is ready, uh, we are in recess, that we will uh, go directly to zoning. Sure. Regular meeting number 56 will now come to order. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? So second, clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We'll now go to the Zoning Committee. Councilmember Page chairs that committee. All members serve on the committee. Chair Page, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. I would like to ask anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variants, including staff, to please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Thank you. I swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you. First variance is 2864-2017. To grant a variance from the provisions of section 33-3302, AR-12, ARLD, and AR-1, apartment residential district use of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 4660 Kenny Road, 43220, to permit limited commercial and manufacturing uses in the LAR-1 limited apartment residential district. The applicant is Kenny Road Storage, LLC. The proposed use is commercial and industrial uses. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is approval. 
I would now like to ask the applicant or the applicant's representative to come forward and to speak to the request to amend to emergency. Welcome to Council Attorney Hodge. Thank you. Good evening, members of council. David Hodge with the law firm Underhill and Hodge. The um, purpose for the request to amend to emergency is this site was rezoned last year from an M1 manufacturing district uh, to an apartment residential district. The site has not yet redeveloped and they don't expect it to redevelop uh, for the next four to five years. So the, so the passage to the amendment to emergency allows uh, existing uses of the property that are, that are legal non-conforming due to the rezoning to continue. Also some uses of the property that are appropriate commercial uses that were probably illegal prior to the rezoning to continue until the site redevelops. And, and, and that makes them effective immediately. Yes, are there any questions for Attorney Hodge? Thank you. I would first like to move to amend this variance to emergency. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. 2975-2017 to rezone 3660 Olentangy River Road 43214 being approximately 3.5 acres located on the east side of Olentangy River Road opposite Latham Court from I Institutional and C2 Commercial Districts to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Spectrum Acquisition Columbus LLC. The proposed use is housing for the elderly and assisted living. The city department's recommendation is approval. There is no area commission for this area. However, there is no known opposition. I would like to ask if there are any additional comments from the applicant. CNN. I would first like to move to waive second reading. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. 2979-2017 to rezone 21 East Arcadia Avenue, 43202, being approximately 0.23 acres, located on the south side of East Arcadia Avenue, approximately 130 feet east of North High Street from C4 Commercial District to R2F Residential District. The applicant is Dean Richard Monin. The proposed use is two dwelling units on one lot. The City Department's recommendation is approval. University Area Commission's recommendation is approval. Are there any additional comments from the applicant? Seeing none, I would first like to move to waive second reading. So moved. Oops, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage. Okay. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. This is the companion piece 2980-2017 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332 R2F residential district use, 3325-231 setback requirements, 3325-241D building design standards, 3325-261 landscaping and screening, 3325-281A parking and circulation, 3332-14 R2F area district requirements, 3332-25B, maximum side yards required, 3332-26C2, minimum side yard permitted, and 3332-27, rear yard of the Columbus City Codes. For the property located at 21 East Arcadia Avenue, 43202, to permit two single unit dwellings on one lot with reduced development standards in the R2F residential district. The applicant again is Dean Richard Monin. The proposed use is two dwelling units on one lot. The city department's recommendation is approval. University Area Commission's recommendation is approval. If there are no questions or comments, I would first like to move to waive second reading. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. 2985-2017 to rezone 4375 Professional Parkway 43135 being approximately 7.52 acres located at the southeast corner of Professional Parkway in Hamilton Square Boulevard from LC4 Limited Commercial District to LM Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant Trevcore Development Limited 
The proposed use is a self-storage facility and limited industrial or office development. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Greater Southeast Area Commission's recommendation is approval. Are there any additional comments from the applicant? Are there any questions or comments for the applicant? Seeing none, I would like to first move to waive second reading. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. I now move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. That's all we have in zoning this evening. Thank you, Chair Page. Any other business to come before the zoning committee? Seeing none, can I get a motion to adjourn regular meeting number 56? Second. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We stand adjourned on 56. Can I get a motion to reconvene regular meeting number 55? It's been moved and seconded. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. We are now back into regular meeting number 55. We just finished with the Economic Development Committee, which was chaired by Council Member Elizabeth Brown. Uh, Council Member Mitch Brown uh, is absent this evening. In his absence, we are going to be proceeding to the Public Safety Committee. It's going to be read by Council Member Page. So Chair Page, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. This evening in public safety, we have Ordinance 2961-2017 to authorize and direct the Finance and Management Director to associate the general budget reservation resulting from this ordinance with the universal term contract purchase agreement with Bound Tree Medical LLC for the purchase of pharmaceutical dispensing machines for the division of fire to authorize the expenditure of $217,994.58 from the safety geo bond fund and to declare an emergency. In an effort to improve the accountability of their pharmaceutical inventory, the Division of Fire is purchasing UCAPIT pharmaceutical dispensing machines for use in fire stations throughout the city. These machines will greatly improve efficiency in the distribution of pharmaceuticals and assist the division in tracking drug uses and identifying trends in inventory management. If there are no further questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Ordinance 3024-2017, to authorize and direct the Public Safety Director of the City of Columbus to accept a grant award following the Fiscal Year 17 Law Enforcement Diversion Program from the Ohio Attorney General's Office to authorize an appropriation of $109,375 from the unappropriated balance of the General Government Grant Fund to the Division of Police to cover the costs associated with the FY17 Law Enforcement Diversion Program and to declare an emergency. This program provides funding to support increased treatment, new tools for law enforcement, and expanding prevention to combat the opioid epidemic. CPD seeks to address the opioid epidemic in Ohio by providing necessary assistance and or referrals to treatment options, recovery support, counseling, and mental health treatment services. The grant award will provide funds for CPD to develop a more formalized method and approach for the enforcement of drug offenses in partnership with the Columbus Division of Fire's Rapid Response Emergency Addiction Crisis Team. If there are no further questions or comments, I would like to move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. President Klein, would you like me to proceed with my other committees? Thank you. Well, if we could turn to page 32, I would now like to proceed with recreation and parks. We have ordinance 2932-2017 to authorize the additional appropriation of $185,000 to the recreation and parks operating fund to authorize the city auditor to set up a certificate in the amount of $185,000 for the purchase of golf chemicals, to authorize the director of finance and management to enter into contract for the purchase of golf course chemicals for the Recreation and Parks Department, and to authorize the expenditure of $185,000 from the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund to waive the formal competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. I would like to ask the director to speak briefly on this ordinance as 
um, Ms. Unger, she comes down and she talks to us a lot just about being citizens of the planet and our responsibility. So could you talk briefly about this and then the additional efforts that the department is taking with our golf courses? Sure, thank you. Uh, President Klein, Council President Pro Tem Tyson, members of council. Uh, this, this legislation, and, and as well as there's a, another piece of legislation on tonight's agenda that talks about uh, increasing our no-mo zones at our golf courses is a combination approach to uh, and what I would call a first step to deal with our chemical uses at our golf courses. Uh, first and foremost, our no-mo zone expansions and, and replanting is to increase and encourage our pollinator areas and, and help with reducing the amount of space on the golf course that needs to be treated and mowed. So that's a, a better for our environment and our golf courses as well as uh, cost savings to us. Uh, and so we're, we're doing that in combination with We've brought a consultant in that's looked at our chemical usage, does, done soil samples, soil testing on all of our golf courses to determine what's the most effect, effective and efficient method and uh, usage of our chemicals so that we can be safer and uh, use less and spend less. Uh, and uh, the emergency on this, of course, is also because uh, we, this process took a little bit of time to go through the study and more time than we were expecting, and yet we want to take advantage of the pricing uh, that we have in this year for funding for next year. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments for the director? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. If we may move to the Housing Committee. Ordinance 2641-2017, to amend Ordinance 0434-2015, passed February 23rd, 2015, to include emergency home repair services, to authorize the Director of Development to enter into contracts with various contractors to provide emergency home repair services to low and moderate income households in Columbus, to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. I am co-sponsoring this ordinance with Councilmember Michael Cinziano and would like to ask the director to speak briefly on why we are waiving the competitive bidding provisions. Thank you, um, Chair Page, uh, President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, members of council. Um, we are waiving competitive bidding because we are um, uh, hiring, we're doing this for multiple uh, contractors. And so we did go through a process to find an appropriate price, and this allows us to move more quickly uh, to get to more projects rather than having a single contract. Thank you, Director. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. 2948-2017, to authorize the appropriation of $1,500,000 from the unappropriated balance of the land management fund to the Department of Development to provide funds for the administration of the land redevelopment division for budget year 2018 and to declare an emergency. The land redevelopment division is also known as our land bank and these funds will continue their operations. If there are no further questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And President Klein, I do have one piece in rules and reference. It's on page 33 of our agenda. 2739-2017, to amend section 919.13 of the Columbus City Code, which deals with the prohibition and authorization of alcoholic beverages at parks and facilities used as event venues in order to correct a typographical error and to declare an emergency. And briefly, the the way the ordinance currently reads, it says with parks, and we would like it to say within the parks. If there are no further questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. That's all I have this evening, President Klein. Thank you, Chair Page. The next committee is Public Service and Transportation. Uh, Councilmember Hardin chairs that committee. Chair Hardin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Um, First, I have Ordinance 1860-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a reimbursement agreement with the Columbus Partnership relative to Smart Columbus to waive the competitive bidding requirements of Columbus City Code and to authorize expenditure of $250,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, Chief Innovation Officer uh, Mike Stevens is here. Would you give uh, some background on this legislation, please? Thank you. Uh, President Klein, Chairman Hardin, members of council, this legislation would authorize a partial reimbursement in the amount of $250,000 to the Columbus Partnership, which hired two firms to quickly assist us with creating operational frameworks for the start of the Smart Columbus initiative. We have approached the Smart Columbus work as a public-private partnership to ensure we are successful now and into the future. 
becoming a smart city requires the investment and alignment of public, private, and academic sectors. To that end, after winning the grant, the Columbus Partnership hired a unique, unique firm named CityFi to assist us with creating an operational framework and procedures on how our public-private partnership would work. They also hired Deloitte to create a Smart Columbus Roadmap, a tool that illustrates the Smart Columbus grant projects and related smart projects in the region. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mike, for, uh, for your work on this. I know this, this piece of legislation in particular kind of fell outside of our normal scope of, of processes, and so I, I appreciate the work that you've done even since then to make sure that most of our uh, uh, pieces and expenditures will come through competitive bids and, and uh, through a normal uh, process on the public side. And the result of some of the work that CityFi did help us establish what, how we're going to work together to do those processes. So in the future, we will be going through uh, the normal order of the process. I appreciate that. Thank you. Seeing no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Yes. Next, I have Ordinance 2874-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Service to reimburse various out the utilities for the utility relocation costs incurred in performing the roadway improvement Scioto Peninsula Duck Bank project and to authorize the expenditure of up to $2,200,000 from the Streets and Highways Bonds Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, this, this project involves constructing an underground utility duct bank ar around the West Town Street area and relocating overhead utilities uh, underground. In the course of the road weight improvement, it is sometimes necessary to relocate these utilities or underground the utilities uh, to promote public health, safety, and welfare of this city. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Or call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Passed. Thank you. Next, I have Ordinance 2894-2017 <laughs> to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into reimbursement agreement with Ohio Health Corporation in connection with Ohio Health Public Infrastructure Improvement Projects and to authorize the City Auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects in the streets and highways bonds fund and to authorize expenditure of three million eight hundred and seventy seven thousand uh, dollars within the streets and highways bonds fund and declare an emergency um, as many folks may remember ohio health is building an eight, uh, 89 million dollar administrative operative operations facility in the northwest area of columbus in the vicinity of 315 and north broadway along olentangy river road in support of the new facility, the city and Ohio Health entered into an economic development agreement in March to coordinate the funding, design, and construction of the project. This legislation provides, the, pr provides for the reimbursement of up to $3,877,000 $3, to Ohio Health for the cost relative to the design and construction uh, of this project. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Next, I have Ordinance 2895-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Service to pay utility relocation costs to various utilities for the Roadway Improvements Creative Campus Projects to authorize the expenditure of up to $2,750,000 for utility relocations for this project and uh, from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and declared emergency. The Public Service Department is currently engaged in the roadway improvements around the Columbus State uh, uh, Columbus Art College and Art and Design and the Columbus Museum of Art uh, area. The project known as the Creative Campus includes roadway reconstruction, sidewalks, streets, uh, trees, drainage, water line improvements, and undergrounding uh, utilities. This legislation is part of a series of, of legislation that will be coming uh, before us, but this pays to relocate uh, the utilities uh, as we move forward with this project. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Passed. Lastly, I have Ordinance 2939-2017 to amend the 2017 Capital Improvement Budget to appropriate funds within the Streets and Highways Improvement Non-Bond Fund within the Federal Transportation Grant Fund and to authorize the City Attorney's Office to acquire fee simple title 
and lesser interest in, into certain partials of real estate to contract for professional services and to negotiate with property owners to acquire the additional rights of ways needed to complete the arterial street rehabilitation Hamilton Road from State Route 161 to Morris Road Phase A project and to authorize the expenditure of up to $5,898,174.86 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund, the Street and Highway Improvement Non-Bond Fund, and the Federal Transportation Grant Fund, and to declare an emergency. This is step two of three to acquire right-of-way associated with uh, the realignment of Hamilton Road around State Route 161. Um, it is important to know that, that this is our portion of this project um, is, is just a portion. $4.7 million is coming from Morpsey. Um, another portion um, uh, of less than that, about 100 some thousand coming from Gahanna, and we're, we're filling in the difference. So this is one of those partnerships that we talk about um, that is uh, good public uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Uh, that's all I have on committees. Thank you. Thank you. The next committee is Technology. Chair Stenziano, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight in Technology, bring forward Ordinance 2615-2017 to authorize the Director of the Department of Technology on behalf of the Civil Service Commission to modify a contract with Government jobs.com, also known as NeoGov, for application hosting services in support of the Insight Enterprise Applicant and Test Management Software System, Applicant Tracking Test Management Software, and Online Job Analysis Data Collection Offsite Testing Software Functionality. In accordance with the provisions of the Sole Source Procurement of the City Code, Chapter 329, to authorize expenditure of $71,559.12 from the Department of Technology, Information Services Division, Information Services Operating Fund, and to declare an emergency. Uh, this is a contract modification will, uh, which allows the department to continue to provide hosting services for their job applicant and test management software systems through December 31st of 2018. It also authorizes the department on behalf of the Civil Service Commission to modify and extend its contract uh, for the application which provides online job analysis, data collection, off-site testing software. This is the only company that provides the software, which is the re reason for the request for sole source procurement. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Next, Ordinance 2958-2017, to authorize the Director of Finance and Management on behalf of the Department of Technology to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate existing purchase agreements with Network Dynamics Incorporated, AT&T, Onyx, USA, LLC, and Wesco for the purchase of supplies, services, and equipment for the City of Columbus, Columbus City Schools Voice Over Internet Protocol Collaborative Project. To authorize the Director of the Department of Technology to modify an existing contract with Hopewell Data Systems and to waive the applicable competitive bidding requirements of Columbus City Code Chapter 329 for the purchase of server licenses for the Voice Over Internet Protocol Collaborative Project. To authorize the Director of the Department of Technology to enter into an agreement with Ornet OSU for the purchase of software licenses, maintenance, and support services for the Voice Over Internet Protocol Collaborative Project, and to authorize the expenditure of $673,871.10, or as much thereof as be, may be necessary for the Voice Over Internet Protocol Collaborative Project, and to declare an emergency. Uh, this ordinance authorizes the procurement of supplies, services, and equipment associated with this collaborative project that we've discussed before. Uh, per Ordinance 2557-2017, Columbus City Schools will pay the City of Columbus for incurred expenses uh, detailed throughout the ordinance. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Okay. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. That's all we have in technology, if I can move to utilities. Tonight in Public Utilities, bring forward Ordinance 2727-2017 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with in situ firm technologies LLC for the blueprint fifth by Northwest aligning project to authorize the appropriation and transfer of two million two hundred fifty two thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and twenty cents from the sanitary sewer reserve fund to the Ohio water development loan fund to authorize the expenditure of two million two hundred fifty two thousand three hundred thirty eight dollars and twenty cents from the Ohio water development loan fund and to amend the 2017 capital improvements budget to provide sufficient authority 
Uh, this project will, will rehabilitate existing sanitary sewer within the City of Columbus, reducing inflow and infiltration of the city sanitary sewer system and mitigate sanitary sewer overflows to basements and waterways in the 5th by Northwest community. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And that's all we have in utilities. I did have, or we had the one piece removed for judiciary. If my colleagues could go to page 27 for ordinance 2908-2017 to authorize the city attorney to enter into a contract with Carpenter, Lips, and Leland LLP for special legal counsel services regarding opioid related matters and to declare an emergency. Uh, I think we all recognize that the city has been uh, really challenged and dealing with the tremendous human devastation, drain on our public resources, and just the financial burden uh, that the opioid epidemic has, not only for our city, region, and state. Mm -hmm. And really would hope uh, or ask uh, Mr. Cox if he could speak to what step this ordinance and this contract could have towards addressing that or where this positions the city of Columbus. Thank you, Chair Stinziano, President Klein, members of council. This will ordinance will authorize the uh, city attorney to enter into a special legal services contract with the law firm of Carpenter, Lips, and Leland to explore what the city's options are in relation to the opioid crisis. Um, those options may or may not include litigation. Um, it's important to note that this contract will be, unlike our typical special counsel contract, will not be paid on an hourly rate out of the city's treasury, but be a contingency only contract, which means that the contract will provide that the there shall be no obligation by the city to pay any uh, pay any fee to special legal counsel as or reimbursement for reasonable litigation expenses if nothing is recovered from any adversary and the city will city agrees to pay attorney's fees and reimburse for reasonable litigation expenses solely on a contingency basis from any recovery related to the portion of any monies received in favor of the city. So even though there is no cost to the city up front um, as for entering into this contract, because we are agreeing to make the uh, commitment for compensation on a contingency only basis, we are seeking council approval to enter into this contract and we would appreciate council support. Are there any questions or comments for Mr. Cox? Okay. Council Member Tyson. Thank you, Thank you Chairman um, Stenziano. And Attorney Cox, can you certainly just state um, the, um, the percentages of should, there, should we be successful um, with this piece of legislation in terms of um, hoping to uh, receive dollars to be able to help us to continue to provide services to the residents should we, should there, um, to this, if we are successful in any litigation, could you just really share the, the percentages of um, a contract like this to be paid to uh, this law firm? Thank you, uh, uh, Council Member Tyson. The, the compensation is based on any recovery that the city receives, depending on what stage of those conversations that recovery takes place. If it's pre-litigation, the compensation is 15% of that recovery. If it's post-litigation being filed, but before the responsive pleading has been filed, it's 20%. And if it's uh, after litigation has been uh, commenced and ongoing, it's 30% of that recovery. Thank you. And um, is this similar to what you've been seeing around the country for other other law firms that have been um, um, look like litigating this, this type of um, case? Yes, I guess the only thing that's a little bit different about the way we're doing it is uh, we are not going directly to litigation um, in this contract. We're, that's one of the options we're looking at, but it does provide for uh, compensation prior to litigation. So in that respect, I think it's a little different than other uh, communities that have initiated litigation direct, right out of the bat. Thank you, uh, Attorney Cox, and I think that that's a good way to pursue um, this particular situation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chairman Stenziano. Seeing no other questions or comments, I'll move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And that's all I have in judiciary and have three items in rules. Uh, the next three ordinances are the proposed utility rate adjustments for 2018 as recommended by the Sewer Water Advisory Board. All three were on first read at our last council meeting and the Public Utilities Committee held a public hearing last Wednesday to present the proposed rates. Again, these rates were approved in October by the Sewer Water Advisory Board. Uh, there is no increase in capacity fees or extra strength charges. Uh, there is no rate structure changes on services charge and commodity changes. Uh, the proposal would be 1% uh, for water, 2% for sewer, and 1% for storm, so 1.53% overall. Uh, and one thing we discussed at the hearing uh, and Councilwoman Page helped point out uh, was the department's ongoing commitment for everything we can do uh, as a department, as a council, uh, to not only continue but promote and grow our low income and senior discount program uh, for those residents and households uh, that are impacted. These rates would go effect if approved on January 1st, 2018. So with that, I will read Ordinance 2728-2017 to amend various sections of Chapter 1105 of the Columbus City Codes and to enact new water rates for the year beginning January 1st, 2018, and to repeal the existing sections being amended. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Next, Ordinance 2768-2017 to amend Chapter 1147 of the Columbus City Codes to enact new sanitary sewer service rates for the year beginning January 1st, 2018, and to repeal the existing sections being amended. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. <coughs> this is a second. Yep. Oh. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And finally, Ordinance 27. 69-2017 to amend section 1149.08 of the Columbus City Codes to enact new stormwater fees for the year beginning January 1st, 2018 and to repeal the existing section being amended. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. I sincerely apologize, I missed that amendment. Uh, First, would like to request to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And now I move for passage. Second. As amended. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. That's all we have on my committees tonight. Thank you, uh, Chair Stenziano. Any other business to come before council? Seeing none, can I get a motion to adjourn regular meeting number 45, or 55? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. We stand adjourned. We do have uh, seven non-agenda speakers. Rules allow us to take six, so we'll call the first six in the order of signing up. 